Um, welcome to our fall uh, robo thesis uh, presentation. I'm going to do a quick sound check, uh, thumbs up, or uh, give me a, you know, let me know if you guys can hear me. And if you can, great. Thank you, Jumbo. Um, excellent. So thank you. So without further ado, we're going to start with Arjun. You're going to get about 20 minutes, okay? Then we're going to do Q&A, and then uh, we're going to follow up with uh, Xiaoming. So same format, 20 minutes, Q&A. Um, and then uh, that, that uh, we only have two presentations today. So uh, whenever you're ready, Arjun, feel uh, free to... You should be able to. Let me see if I... Let me make you co-host, if you are not. You should try, give it a try. You should be able to. Oh, I mean, it's supposed to be Oh, and then for some reason, I'm not sure. Um, uh, maybe, I think it's Charity. Who's... Okay, Charity, I think maybe you have to enable screen sharing. Yes, I already did just, yep, all good. Try again, Arjun. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, you want to do a sound check? The, the microphone should be able to pick you up without uh, any yeah, problem. To those of you online, if you can hear orange, please let us know. You want to try again? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. We're good. Uh, yeah. So whenever you're ready. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Arjun. Um, and the previous topic, uh, my type, his title is Vision Based Object Aware Engines Week for Single Job Construction. Um, um, before we started, I can thank my professor uh, and my advisor, Professor Pati Chaudhary, for his constant support and guidance. Um, yeah, so getting into it, um, we kind of motivated by the problem of uh, how humans have this innate ability to understand the 3D structure of a scene. Um, so, uh, given, uh, uh, so they had, uh, so they, and they also had like 3D flyers, uh, which had them kind of, like, kind of fill up shapes. Uh, for example, if you see a car coming around a corner, uh, you can see it's a black color SUV. So you kind of estimate how the shape of the car would be, uh, and that can, and this kind of infers your decision making process. Um, if you bring the context to uh, machine vision, uh, like the ability to understand the content within an image is an essential task in computer vision as well. We have rapidly progressed from uh, understanding, uh, from basically like understanding the presence of objects in a scene to like pixel by pixel classification. Uh, in the instant and semantic segmentation. Uh, but this is all like still restricted to like 2D object detection. Um, and, you know, having 3D structure, understanding the 3D structure of a scene is kind of critical in computer vision. Uh, in, in, in many of the robotic applications, the robot has to interact with their physical environment or in just autonomous vehicle understanding the 3D information, geometry information is kind of vital in making, uh, in kind of measuring, making accurate object measurements. Uh, as well as you know, creating an immersive AR and VR experience. So uh, most of the uh, 3D vision data that you can. Can I ask you to turn on your video uh, just oh. so that this way? Because I think we're this camera has you sort of looking at your side. So sure. thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you look at the uh, traditional like data uh, 3D data representation formats, we have like. Uh, Point clouds uh, and voxel grids and meshes. So uh, for point clouds, um, for any like 3D learning uh, vision, 3D object detection, or any vision-based algorithms, uh, require a lot of additional pre-processing, uh, and sometimes they suffer due to uh, occlusions. Um, similarly, with voxel grids, like most of the algorithms today, uh, like convert point clouds to voxel grids, uh, and these uh, voxel-based representations uh, grow cubically with resolution. Um, and similarly to point cloud meshes also um, uh, require a lot of pre-processing uh, and uh, they have this, uh, yeah, and they also have a degradation uh, in performance when occlusions are low. Um, so keeping all this in mind, like building 3D shape priors is uh, very computation expensive and is often limited to offline analysis for like real world data sets. Yeah, um, so the objective of our, uh, uh, the thesis work is basically to investigate the limits of novel view synthesis uh, from single image based on real world data sets uh, to see how they cope with noise and, and uh, street level imaging. Um, and the basic key contributions are like we optimize the neural radiance fields on nerves uh, over street level imagery uh, uh, as you know, allowing the model to cope with in, uh, noise and image segmentation as well as occlusions. Um, we decompose an, uh, a scene into relevant objects of interest uh, and use uh, instance specific tiny nerve models 
uh, to represent these objects. Uh, since these objects are some sort of, uh, these objects and all these, these tiny MLPs also serve as uh, shape priors. Um, as they, a single uh, MLP is used to represent all the objects in a, single, in a category. Um, and uh, they can generalize to unseen use of the same object. Uh, since these MLPs are much smaller than the traditional log based ones, uh, they, have, they have faster inference times and they kind of be bring down the inference time to around 0.25 uh, second, seconds, uh, which almost makes it uh, near real time and most suitable for robotic applications. Uh, we also kind of uh, evaluate the improvement in the accuracy of downstream tasks, uh, such as 2D object detection and 3D object detection. For example, um, if you get a, if you use the traditional or uh, object detection on image and get a low confidence score, you could possibly render new views of the same scene and see how the object detection improves uh, in the new rendered scenes. Uh, and lastly, we also incorporate uh, priors um, using, since there's a lot of uh, synthetic data sets available, we use object priors. Uh, via meta learning, uh, which kind of uh, helps us help our know, model to generalize faster. So, before we start, small background on uh, neural implicit representations. Um, so, basically, most of the signals in nature could be uh, either categorized as continuous and discrete. Uh, all the signals we see, like, uh, like images, voxel grids, are all discrete of nature. Um, and basically, an implicit representation or neural implicit representation is that we use a neural network to approximate these continuous signals. Uh, for example, sign distance function is one sort of implicit representation. Uh, we, if we have a point in 3D space and uh, if we, uh, the output, if we give that point of the network, the output of the network basically signifies that the object is within uh, the off, within, if the point is within the object or outside or on the surface, if, then uh, the output of the network would be one if the point is outside and it's uh, minus one if the point is inside or if it's on the surface, it's zero. So, um, Neural radiance fields are popularly known as nerves, are also an example of uh, these continuous volume representations. Um, so the idea behind it is given many uh, views of an object, uh, you basically build uh, a, a volume representation um, of an object, and uh, you kind of uh, you use a neural network to uh, represent this, uh, this volume representation. For example, uh, you have uh, Multiple images, uh, and then you use a neural network. So uh, you can you shoot a pixel to every uh, shoot a ray to every pixel in an image, and using ray tracing, you sample points along the ray, uh, and these points along with the camera information as the view direction is given as input to the neural network, and this basically uh, gives out the output of a color and uh, alpha density value for that particular uh, point. Now, um, and we uh, use uh, from this alpha density and these color values, we use volume rendering basically. Um, render a final image, and uh, we use like a rendering loss, which is nothing but a photometric loss of difference between every pixel value with the corresponding ground truth uh, to train the network. Now, there are a lot of limitations with uh, the traditional nerve model. Uh, even though it kind of represents a continuous underlying function using a neural network, uh, it still focuses uh, a lot of, uh, uh, like, it, you still need a lot of images to train. And it takes a lot of it has a lot of rendering time. Essentially, it's memorizing a scene, so you can't generalize to unseen views of an object. And novel view synthesis is often limited to like interpolation between views. Um, so come to our method. So we basically, given a single input image, uh, we uh, encode uh, this image. Um, we basically decompose the image into relevant objects of interest, and we encode uh, this information in an occupancy mask. Um, and we use a tiny uh, no, MLP to represent uh, this as an implicit neural representation. So since uh, this tiny MLP basically represents all the uh, objects in a category or instance specific, these can be used as priors to basically enable uh, completely deconstruction. Uh, and they consider it like a database where uh, you could resynthesize normal views of uh, the same object. So uh, we basically begin with an optic segmentation. So given an image, uh, we basically decompose the image into relevant objects of interest, and each object has a subsequent mask associated with it. We take only objects which we want. Uh, for example, like uh, here we have cars, we have uh, kind of a road uh, uh, mask and stuff. So um, from this, we get basically two masks, one for every object in a scene. So we get the RGB mask as well as the, um, the binary mask. And so binary mask basically signifies uh, what are foreground pixels and what are background pixels, uh, pixels of interest. So, um, and then we use uh, these individual masks are given as input to the autoencoder. So the autoencoder network uh, basically is a CNN feature extractor. 
that is used to generate uh, the shape and latent codes, uh, shape uh, latent codes, basically which are the shape codes and the color code, um, which we condition the network on, um, uh, which we condition the network on. So the if you if, uh, at the, at the end of the uh, these kind of auto encoders, um, the end these last few layers are kind of replicated to form two parallel heads. Uh, one for gen responsible for generating the shape code, and the other is responsible for generating the color code. Um, so we kind of first experimented with having uh, so the decoder part of this network is basically an instant specific NMLB, uh, where given an input of a 3D point, uh, as well as condition of the appropriate uh, latent embedding code, it outputs the color or the uh, color and the transmit uh, the alpha values, alpha density values. But uh, with we experiment with the traditional nerves, uh, I mean traditional like one neural network uh, acting as a decoder, but we kind of the reconstruction was not that great. Uh, so I mean taking a cue from all the other recent works, we kind of split that into uh, two networks: one responsible for generating the uh, alpha values, uh, uh, and is and one responsible for generating the colored uh, RGB values. So um, these uh, the the alpha. Uh, now, uh, the alpha tiny MLP is basically conditioned on the shape code, while the color uh, decoder is basically conditioned on the color codes. So, uh, given a point in space, uh, we basically given the occupancy mask. We sample points uh, only when uh, only in those regions of object uh, where the objects of interest are present uh, as input to the uh, instant uh, specific MLPs, along with uh, the appropriate shape or color code to represent them. Uh, so the output basically uh, of them will be the alpha values as well as the uh, color values. And this also helps you have splitting the two decoders also helps the network basically sample points more efficiently in the uh, occupancy mask. Um, and we use like volume rendering to basically uh, find, give the final rendered image. So as you can see, like there is an, if, considering the input of a car, if this car is perfectly seen, we completely render a novel uh, view of the object from a different direction, uh, completely generalize over unseen views as well. Uh, for the training part, we kind of employ two loss functions, uh, one responsible for the occupancy uh, map and one responsible for the final rendered image. So we, um, the, the photometric loss is one of the losses we employ. Uh, this is kind of uh, similar to an autoencoder loss, where we force uh, the, the model to fit, uh, we force the uh, model to fit the input uh, by generating uh, the appearance and uh, color codes, uh, latent embeddings and decoding them and using the decoder to decode them into like object gradients fields uh, using these uh, latent embeddings. Uh, we also employ an, uh, an occupancy loss, uh, which we use for the, uh, the shape decoder. So what essentially this uh, enables us is to one sample points in the uh, occupancy map, uh, map more efficiently, um, as well as this is basically this is a classification kind of loss where we classify whether a pixel is a foreground pixel of interest or not. And the total loss is basically the weighted sum of uh, both these losses. Um, so the results, um, as you can see, like given one image and a scene, uh, which is kind of noisy with the background, uh, we are able to complete, like get a kind of an accurate 3D uh, representation, uh, which is accurate in terms of color and, and geometry. But uh, one advantage of our method is that we don't use any prior camera information, where most of the existing of models uh, require some sort of uh, prior in terms of camera or require the camera information. And we don't use any geometrical information priors as well. Uh, but as you can see, the rendered uh, is uh, output is not completely photorealistic. Uh, this is because, like we, we, I mean, for more robotic applications, we kind of infer the geometry and the appearance, uh, and this enables faster rendering time. So it's kind of a trade-off between how photorealistic you want and how accurate in terms of shape and, and color. Um, to give a better uh, visual representation, if you can look at the uh, uh, complete, this is completely rendered uh, normal views. So given a just a single image, you're able to like push uh, and uh, push and pull through in the camera space, uh, completely rendering uh, novel views as you go. And you could also do it in other directions, like probably the Y and the Z direction from top-down approaches, so just a single image. Um, and uh, since you have these object radius fields, you can even you know completely you see anything and place them in different directions. So uh, as I was discussing earlier, like we use an object detection algorithm to basically, uh, if you use an object detection on the original uh, image, uh, I'm sorry, but you can't see clearly, but like these kind of cards are, have low confidence scores of like 57%. Uh, but if we kind of render them from novel views, we can validate these uh, object detections, by right? And these cards are, again, you can't see them. Sorry about that, but they have a higher uh, confidence scores of 96%. 
So comparing uh, Ahmedabad to like uh, other uh, standards in, in the now based uh, regions, um, before I mean the, the input to the pixel now is uh, I had to like uh, you know it's a lot of pre-processing which I, uh, is given as an input. For example, I had to like uh, use uh, some point render segmentation for smooth contours to remove all the background, and then I had to normalize it and then give it to the you know, pixel nerve to chain. Uh, our model kind of uh, works much better, um, even though a lot of processing is done in pixel now. Our model is able to incorporate noise of, uh, of the background as well, and uh, you get a much better representation than compared to pixel now. But if I do, uh, if I just work with pixel now without any pre-processing, I, as you can see, the model, the, the outputs are not viable. It, the, the pixel nerve is not able to handle noise. And also keeping in mind the pixel now takes a huge amount of resources for training, as well as like it takes a lot of time for renting as well. So there's there's a completely uh, huge inference time. Um, and lastly, like we also uh, incorporate uh, priors uh, via initialization as well. So um, th there's a lot of synthetic data available. Uh, so in order to make a model generalize faster, we use a federated ab average optimization algorithm. Uh, by meta learning to basically learn priors over these shapes uh, from synthetic data such as ShapeNet. Uh, and if you observe the images on the right, uh, you basically get a, a, a 10th epoch, you get faster uh, or more accurate uh, generalization than compared to like you start the model or train the model from the beginning. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'd love to take any questions if anyone has. Okay, so I'm going to. See if there's any questions in the audience. So I have a question. Sure. Uh, can you go to the slide where you show the four the cars between the pixel nerf and the yeah? Okay, yeah. So how how are you measuring? Like how close, like which one is better? Um in terms of the, the synthesized views. I, I mean, I, I I thought of using some quantitative value like photometric uh, loss, but that doesn't like make sense because okay. it's just a pixel by pixel kind of loss. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one assumption is that I've done a lot of pre-processing, and even if you look at the images, uh, yeah. we get a much more complete images. Um, and like if you look at the the first uh, row and the last column, uh, we get a much more smoother and accurate image. Oh, and, I see. So the the black line is not yeah, accurate. and then compared to a pixel of chain are the same. Set. Okay. Yeah. I think it would be nice if I mean I know these things are hard, right? But it's it's it would be nice. It would be interesting if we can find a way to do comparison. Yeah, you know, yeah. Okay. A, a quantitative, I guess. Is more yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the other work uh, which I wanted to compare didn't have like uh, ready-made code bases or something. Yeah. So I couldn't yeah. validate my result. But this, yeah. Like, I mean, at the end, we I we thought of PSNR or something, but there's like almost a little more time. Yeah, well, the other thing is like, you know, there's certain, um, I forget what the terminology was, but like, um, you know, so there there is literature like in the, I think it's like weather forecasting or something where they're looking at, you know, cloud shapes or something, right? And so there's, so they do have ways of like measuring like right. metrics of like shapes and discrepancies between shapes right. sometimes, right? And so sometimes maybe they're not the best, but, you know, yeah, sure. Can, yeah, gives you some exactly. idea of like you know where in what direction to go sometimes. Right? Yeah. Um, and then I had another question. So I think it's like the second, the slide before your question uh, slide, because you were talking about. Um, so explain yeah. to me um, which one is the one. You know, which one was which one is the image that had more epochs versus the one that didn't. Um, the one did on I... the left. Um, okay. The... No, I mean, both have 10. at the 10th epoch. Okay. Our model is big. I mean, if you lose, like, uh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, the column on the right hand side yeah. is, is yours, yeah. basically. Okay. 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 So we have a question here from uh, ZJ. What's the key difference between your improved model, let me finish reading, uh, and the default NERF? Um, one is that we are able to like train over steep level imagery, while NERF requires a lot of constrained settings. Mm -hmm. And most of the NERF uh, data requires, uh, I mean, works on synthetic kind of data. And uh, yeah, they require a normal views as well, complete uh, 3D view, but our model doesn't. And NERF is kind of still limited to interpolation between views. It cannot generalize to an unseen view of an object. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions? Let's thank Arjun. And so we'll do a round of applause. Um, is it going to recommend? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you, Arjun. 
uh, Shaming, when you uh, get a chance, if you want to share your screen, let's do a sound check. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can hear you. Let me just adjust the volume a little bit. Give me a sec. Try again. Okay. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, excellent. So whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead and start. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone and uh, welcome to my this presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my uh, advisor, Professor uh, Shi for his guidance on this project. Um, so basically, um, the problem that I want to tackle in this um, project is single view 3D reconstruction in an unsupervised manner. And a major um, methodological contribution is latent diffusion and contrastive learning. Uh, and just to formulate the problem a little bit further, uh, single view 3D reconstruction refers to a computer vision task where we have a single 2D image view of the object as an input, and we we'll try to reconstruct the full 3D model of the object. It's essentially an ill posed problem because of the uncertainty of the depth estimation and also self occlusion. So it means we need to acquire the prior knowledge about the shape, um, which translates to deep learning language, meaning that we need to train on a very large data set. And there may be more outputs um, for a single view 3D reconstruction, includes the texture of the object and also the pose of the camera that captures the input to the view. So um, you can categorize the reconstruction tasks based on the supervision model. Um, for a supervised task, it requires a 3D ground truth. Basically, the model output the 3D model and it's directly compared to a 3D target to compute a geometric loss. But such data set is very sparse in reality because it's very hard to acquire. Um, and also versus the unsupervised um, data set where we only have several or only single 2D views for a single instance in the data set. There are no 3D ground truths. And the complete training loop is to generate a 3D model from 2D images, but it has to be rendered back to 2D images to close the loop. So it's directly com it's compared to a 2D target image to compute a 2D loss. And in order to, for the loss to be back propagated to the whole network, we need a differentiable renderer. So after, um, survey on uh, current approaches doing the uh, 3D reconstruction task, we found that a majority of the problem still requires a 3D ground truth, like the full 3D mesh or key points of the object, uh, or some of them are relying on uh, assumptions. So for the methods that use uh, 3D reconstruction in an unsupervised manner, I want to um, present two uh, current approaches or one is the unsup 3D. It basically it majorly deals with human faces. So it assumes the image to be frontal um, and there is no backgrounds. And the intermediate results includes depth estimation, uh, the albedo or the ambient color, and also uh, information about the light sources and the view. And it also uh, similarly using a differentiable renderer to get a 2D image. For Henderson's uh, work, it, um, the pipeline is similar, but it doesn't generate a texture for those 3D uh, objects. So um, viewing the unsupervised current approaches, we find that um, most of them either uh, relies on assumptions about the object or they provide limited information about a 3D object. And that's why we found a space of our uh, research. So uh, to introduce the methodology using our pipeline, the first one would be diffusion models, which is very popular nowadays in computer vision tests, such as image generation. The basic idea is to transform a random vector to an um, training data image. So the idea is giving the training data image as x0, we gradually add some uh, standard normal distributed noise at each time step. And gradually it will transform into a total mass. And then in the reverse process, we try to recover the original image by using a um, deep learning model to predict the noises that are being added during the forward process. And if the noises are predicted correctly, then if we subtract the noises from a noisy image XT, it will recover a less noisy image XT minus one. And that's why we say, the noises will encode information about the image. And using such a model would allow us to uh, randomly sample the image from a random vector. 
For predicting the um, noises, we use an um, architecture called UNET. Um, it has a it has a shape that likes the letter U, where you have a um, downsampling phase and an upsampling phase. So it's very useful to in image to image uh, translation tasks because the input and output image has the same dimension. Here the scenario is uh, the same. We have the same dimension for the image at all time steps and also the noises. Diffusion models uh, essentially transform a uh, very complex data distribution of the image into a distribution that is very regularized and we'll explain its advantage later. So you may notice that um, with a diffusion model, I can randomly sample as training uh, data, but how do I control a model to um, generate exactly what I want? The idea is to use a conditional signal where we use an encoder to encode the shape that we want, like a chair, into a shape Latin code. And the shape Latin code can be concatenated and fed into the noise prediction um, network at each time step. And finally, it will uh, output a, a model uh, that we want, but still with some randomness regarding the shape. The reason we want to use diffusion model is it has uh, very high details and diversity um, which is presented in uh, latest work, and also uh, have very stable training patterns compared to other generative methods like GAN. The disadvantage would be um, it requires multiple inference because we have multiple time step for a single network. But we'll introduce how to mediate this problem later. So as for our methodology, we use a little bit variant of the conditional diffusion model called Latin diffusion. So the idea is to combine the Latin diffusion, uh, the conditional Latin diffusion with a, a pre-trained O2 encoder. An O2 encoder transfer data A to data B in an encoder-decoder structure with intermediary Latin co-representation. And the way we introduce diffusion model here is by using a diffusion model to learn the uh, Latin code. Uh, so we put the Latin code as Z0 which is the um, noiseless image data in our diffusion model. And then we run the forward noising process to get the uh, random noise. And then we do the reverse process to recover um, the model. The whole uh, diffusion process is conditioned on the input signal A. And during inference time, we can just drop the encoder E. We can sample uh, a random ZT and then condition on the input A, I would get um, the Latin code Z0, which is then fed to the decoder to generate the results B that we want. The, re the motivation behind using such Latin diffusion as a generative process for a reconstruction network is because it kinds of introduce randomness into our network. If we're using a deterministic O2 encoder, then the deterministic results, if it wants to um, minimize the loss between itself and a random um, target, like the back of an object would be random if we can see it. But if we try to use a deterministic uh, result to um, approximate it, then the result will be very blurry. Whereas when I introduce randomness here, it would uh, output a randomness, a random distribution to approximate the model so it can preserve image quality. The other reason is that we want to use diffusion. Latin diffusion will allow us to decrease the dimension of the um, data that we run diffusion on um, from the whole image pixel space to Latin space. So we can mediate the problem of computational cost of a regular diffusion model. And how does that do with our 3D reconstruction network? So basically, how we introduce the baseline that we use is called share with the neighbor in the ECCB paper. And the idea is similar. We have an input to the image and then using an encoder to generate um, the corresponding Latin code for different 3D attributes like the shape, the texture, and the camera pose and the background image. And then we use a renderer to synthesize all these attributes to re reconstruct the 2D image. The way we introduce Latin diffusion here is um, by using the diffusion model to learn the Latin code for each 3D attributes, the shape and the texture. So uh, the procedure is this. 
after a pre-trained um, share with the neighbor autoencoder network, we get the Latin code uh, for shape and texture. Then we feed them to a Latin diffusion model as the uh, noiseless data, Z0. And then we run the diffusion process to get ZT. And then we get the we run the reverse process to get Z0 back. And in this way, um, we get a diffusion model and the whole thing is conditional on the input image I. During the inference time, we drop the encoder E and then we randomly sample a Z0. By conditioning on the input image I, it randomly generates a sample that we want that corresponds to the image I. And then it's replaced to the O2 encoder to fed to the decoder and generates all the 3D attributes and synthesize it to the image as usual. Just some quick details. Uh, the shape is represented as a deformation field that kind of transform a sphere to um, the shape of the object. And the texture is uh, UV mapped from a, a rectangular uh, to the, sp the spherical surface uh, in a way similar to uh, how the Earth's coordinate system works. And also for pose is categorized as a, a fine transform where you have the rotation, the scaling, and the tr translation vector. Also noted that it's not the first uh, pipeline that we come up with. Actually, um, the first pipeline is regarding um, VAE, but we found that diffusion to be a more powerful model and uh, we'll, we just come up with a second version. The problem with this unsupervised learning is that since the lack of the 3D ground truth supervision, if we only have 2D supervision, the model is prone to cheat the 3D, 2D supervision by just um, output the results that the 2D supervision wants. So it's not getting a full 3D model, but only a 2D plan that is tailored to present it to the 2D supervision signal. And the solution would be the data augmentation, which will introduce as cross instance consistency here. Um, cross instance consistency is proposed in the ECCB paper. And the basic idea is to um, find the neighbors of an instance in the data set. So if you find the neighbors regarding the shape, um, call them A and B, then we can replace the shape of B with the shape of A so that the shape of A when combined with the texture of B would produce an image B. It will provide additional um, supervision signal. It will also utilize different camera poses of other samples to avoid the problem of degeneracy. Similarly, we can run the uh, same thing on texture neighbors. The improvements that are proposed uh, based on the ECC paper is contrastive learning, where we are not only using the neighbor as supervision signal, but also the strangers. So if A and B are strangers regarding shape, then the shape of A when uh, combined with all the other 3D attributes of B would produce an image B that's not very close, uh, that is different to the um, 2D supervision of image B. And such a loss would gonna be maximized in our training strategy. Uh, just some details. So we use cosine um, distance to measure the, dis uh, the distance between uh, the Latin code uh, for different instances. And also the final loss would be the reconstruction uh, of the normal instances and also the neighboring instances and the uh, stranger instances. Now regarding experiments, uh, we run the whole pipeline on um, four data sets. The first of all uh, is the BIRDS um, data sets called CUP. So um, here we show the input and the 3D meshes and the normal vector um, corresponding to uh, the local normal direction, the background image and the reprojected 2D image, and also the texture bound to the 3D mesh. We also do a relational study and show the original um, reconstruction if it's run without uh, the Latin diffusion and contrastive learning. And also our cup data sets has this uh, segmentation and key points come along. So we use them as uh, ground truths to evaluate uh, our, uh, our performance. The second one is the Pascal's 3D plus data set where we have 3D ground truths here, although it's not used in training, but it's used for evaluation. So metrics like intersection over union uh, regarding both the 3D 
vo uh, voxel occupancy and the segmentation mass is used. The third one is the shape net, um, where it's a very uh, diverse uh, data set comprising of all kinds of objects. And in the same time, uh, in the same time, uh, it's a 3D data set and we can use 3D metrics, but also uh, we use um, the 3D model uh, capture at uh, the poses that are the same in the original pipe uh, in, in the baseline method in order for um, better evaluation. Okay. And finally, we uh, generalize the pipeline to uh, human face reconstruction, uh, a web face uh, data set where it's very diverse regarding both the ethnics, uh, um, the sex, the age, color, uh, eyeglasses, and all the stuff uh, to uh, validate our generalizability. And also it is a 2D data set. So here's our uh, quantitative results on all the four data sets. For um, the Casio web face data sets, uh, we use uh, uh, PSNR uh, as a result because it's kind of used in uh, benchmarks related to the Casio web faces. We see that um, we achieve some improvements over the baseline, which is unicorn. And uh, especially in the PESCO 3D and the Casio web face uh, data sets. Also, we even um, have achievable results uh, with some supervised uh, methods, which is kind of surprising. And um, a useful uh, application of our uh, method regarding the introduction of randomness is that we can um, you do the Latin so-called Latin interpolation between training two training instances in the data set. So in this way, we can generate um, instances that we've never seen before. So uh, for example, here we visualize all the data uh, training instances uh, in the data sets regarding two Latin dimensions. And here for the autoencoder, because of the Latin distribution is not regularized very well, uh, it has multiple mo modes and it tends to have holes uh, between the modes. And if we, if we do a Latin uh, interpolation, if we connect them uh, using a line, then we see it pass through the hole and maybe the generated results would be off the probability mode and would be create a re unrealistic image. But for diffusion models, since uh, the Latin space is a standard normal distribution, then uh, it's almost guaranteed that the line will not cross in any holes. So it will always uh, generate a realistic image. So here's the autoencoder. We see the uh, distribution is complex and it's kind of being um, converged to a single uh, regularized distribution by the diffusion model. And that's also one advantage here. Because of we having separated Latin space for all these different uh, 3D attributes like texture and shape, we also have the very good property of so-called disentangled Latin interpolation. So basically, uh, we can achieve the full uh, progression from one instance to another. And also we can achieve progression on each uh, attribute, like on the mesh attributes where we gradually transform from one shape to another while keeping the texture the same. And we can also keeping uh, the shape the same and gradually uh, changing the texture. Regarding the prospect uh, future works of our um, uh, of the project, it can be used uh, 3D reconstruction is very useful um, for perception like augmented reality and mixture reality because we want to um, perceive uh, what's the shape of our environment so we can play some virtual objects on it. We can also, it's very also very useful uh, uh, in digital twin system where we can upload environment objects as 3D assets uh, into the game or something like that. And also for perception of robotics, um, in that case, it would be a monocular. We can use a um, monocular or RGB camera to determine um, the shape of the environments and uh, create a simultaneous mapping of the environments. Finally, possible extension of our work may involve a combining with segmentation, which better separates the background, and also combine with implicit models and NERF, so we can have a, a continuous representation of the shape, so we can scale continuously. And also we can do domain adaptation where we train on a 
um, limited small data set we can apply on a large or even in the wild data set. And also for real-time inference or um, embedded systems like robotics and AR glasses, we also use knowledge distillation to kind of uh, compress the model into a small one. So to enable uh, lightweight deployments on this uh, embedded systems. Yep, and that's it. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, questions from the audience. Let me yep. see if I, uh, I'm gonna remove the spotlight from you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions? So I have a question um, and apologize because you know I'm this is the this is a mechanical engineer asking this question. So what exactly is this diffusion model doing? So is the is the hypothesis that the original latent space is effectively non-Euclidean and that somehow by you know employing this diffusion model, you're somehow bringing um, basically transforming the data into some kind you know into a metric space? Yeah, so um, I think there are two uh, properties with diffusion model. So one is uh, randomness. So for O2 encoder structure is essentially deterministic and it cannot capture the random distribution. Like if, you, if we have a bag of an object, we cannot see it and we can only guess it. But if we use a deterministic result to approximate such random um, targets, then we get a blurry result if we want to minimize the loss. But for a diffusion model, we can, we can randomly sample an instance. And in that way, we can approximate, uh, we can minimize the loss in the same time to preserve the image quality. Great, and thank you. Any yeah, that's the first one. Okay. And another okay. one is, is that diffusion model uh, in the Latin space is a standard normal distribution. And- okay. By standard normal distribution is kind of well regularized and has very good property for Latin interpolation and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I, I missed that part. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Dan, go ahead. Uh, fantastic uh, presentation and uh, thanks very much. Um, sort of similarly, you know, I, I'm a clinician, but I'm, I'm sort of curious. Um, this is really fascinating how you can sort of recreate the visual um, uh, view, obviously, of, of the different angles. But uh, I'm a little bit curious about how scale translates and then how um, could you potentially assess uh, how accurate a recon three dimensional reconstruction is when you think about scale of size? And I think about this sort of for, for clinical applications. If I can only see, you know, one view of an organ or whatever, and and in my mind, I have a general sense of how big these organs should be. And so I can sort of recreate it in my head. But when you use these types of models, um, are you able, able to, to get an assessment or a sense uh, somehow of, of how the overall size of the three-dimensional reconstruction might compare to a ground truth? Um, yeah, so essentially um, the model outputs is uh, a 3D mesh and you can perform a lot of statistics on uh, the 3D model, like the size of the organ or something. And it will also have very uh, specialized metrics uh, for this, like the intersection over union, is kind of uh, uh, um, related to uh, the the organ size uh, a lot. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? If not, this concludes our fall 2022 <laughs> presentation for our Robo thesis presentation. I want to thank uh, Xiaoming and I want to thank Arjun uh, for doing great presentations. Thanks again to everyone. Good luck on exams. Good luck finishing the semester and congratulations to those of you who are graduating.